All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. And um, well, firstly, thank you for inviting me as well. So a uh, huge thanks to Ian and the uh, Pet People team and to Lydia at VPS for inviting me down. I hope you find what I'm going to say tonight interesting. Um, I'm uh, probably preaching to the converted in some ways, but uh, just really this question of, and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, I don't know if I should say this, I'm a very pro, ardent pro European. I bloody hate Brexit. So I'm being a little bit sarcastic by saying take back control. Because I think what we're going to talk about is I think we've lost control partly of, of animal imports and numbers. And so I find this, here we are, I have control of borders and all of us in clinical practice are starting to go, whoop, I think we've got a problem. So um, really, but also to get some serious stuff about infectious disease. Uh, a little bit about me, just I'm uh, very privileged to work with Lydia and the team of Virtual Vector Specialists, which is awesome. If you don't use VVS, then I'd suggest you get in touch with Lydia and have a chat about VVS. Um, I'm an internal medicine specialist, did my residency at Cambridge 20 years ago um, now. So, and I'm just opening a new referral centre up near Cambridge, which if I'm looking slightly stressed, and I apologise for it. Um, so, grab it. Let's see. So, um, what we're going to do, uh, I'm going to, the plan for this evening is I'll talk until you tell me to stop, but probably around about an hour or so. Lydia knows that might overrun. So, um, we just want a little bit of setting the scene of, well, how many dogs do you talk about? How many dogs do we have in the UK? How many dogs are imported? Is this a problem at all? Which is something we talk about. Then I thought we'd just run through what I at the moment consider to be major bacterial problems that we could be, could be facing, uh, protozoal disease, viral and parasitic disease. Um, and I thought we'd break it up about from a clinical point of view. Uh, and then happy to take some questions. Now I've got one side at the end just to put a little question out there. Um, well, let's see and, and, and see what you think. So, thank you. Next time. So, you probably all know this. Um, number of dogs and cats in the UK have gone up hugely in the last three years. And if this is um, taken um, from uh, the Pet Food Manufacturers Database, if you took this slide in 2018, there were 9 million dogs and 6 million cats. So the cats in the UK over COVID doubled, the number of dogs have gone up by nearly 75%. Okay, so we've got, and that's, so not only did Brexit stuff us because we've lost those of foreign, like lots of Italian and Spanish vets going home, your case though, it has genuinely gone up because the number of patients we've got are going through the roof. Okay, so this is, um, this is partly, I'm saying this because let's be kind to ourselves, there is a reason we're all feeling a bit of stress at the moment practice. But also, if there's more and more patients coming through the door and there's more and more dogs in the country that we know about, and we're talking mainly about dogs tonight, um, then if there's an infectious disease problem, then that's going to magnify more quickly. So there is, I think, this is something we do need to be really conscious of. Thank you. And also, just look at the number of households of the pet. And again, this I think is quite stark. This is going up. This is pre-pandemic, up to nearly two-thirds of households have a pet. And this is classified as dog, cat, rabbit, or small furry. And if you think here, so the average is sitting at around 45%. That means less than a lot of owners here are not experienced pet owners. So we've got people here who aren't experienced in, in what they're doing that may, are they economically able to look after the pet as well? Are we able to reach them in the way that we want to as clinicians? So if there's a disease process brewing, this is the little cohort, little massive cohort of patients that I'm worried we might over time start to cause us a problem because this could be a little area where disease can, can grow. Thank you. So I think the increase in numbers um, certainly being increased the risk of disease to other pets. Um, it also potentially is human health, because some things we're going to talk about today, we're talking about something like leishmania. Um, in theory, leishmania, the vector of leishmania is not present in the UK. I'll challenge that. And we've got some one case report where we just don't know. And so there is a risk, and with global warming, this is a multifactorial talk, global warming is definitely part of what we talk about here. I do read the vet record occasionally, yes, I need to get out more, I know. Um, but looking at blue tongue, you know, if I go back now, that's a midge-based disease that, that we didn't think about blue tongue 10 years ago. It, it's something you'd see occasionally, anyone who's been taught about blue tongue? No, I think. No. <laughs> so we're not really teaching it at undercut level very much. It's, it's something we're worried about because we see more and more midges coming over. Wow. I mean, so this is, well, I think when I was back at Cambridge, I think that nine tenths of these we're going to talk about tonight, I didn't teach the undergrads as residents. It was part of my board exams, I've got to know about these just in case, because it's a European exam. But now, these are things we, we need to be aware of, and I'm sure things from some of these people say you're going to talk about, you, you treat it. And I think this is the other thing, is without, you know, cost of living crisis is real. Uh, doesn't matter where you are, if we're nice, lovely down here in South West London, or in my lovely leafy Cambridge, or wherever you are in the world, people are struggling to pay what we do. 
and therefore preventative healthcare is potentially going down, fewer people coming back to patients, fewer people doing antiparasiticides, etc. So I think it's a genuine risk of reduction of our ability to monitor for disease. And when some of these diseases we talk about could be clinically silent for a long time, um, then I think there is a there is a real there is a potential worry. The good thing I say is though, we don't if there was a huge problem, it'd be we'd talk about it all the time. So we we don't know about incidents yet. And I think one thing I'm it's a bit like if you if you want 10 minutes of your life, it's interesting, I've written a little blog on raw foods, which we could have talked about that. But, but again, we're saying, I think there's a real bar about feeding raw food, but we don't actually know if there's a problem because we don't have numbers. And I think one of the things as, we, us as a profession we need to do is we need to really be pulling in some really good data on how many infectious disease cases are we seeing? How many of these diseases I'm gonna talk about now truly are happening in the UK, having a proper disease register. Um, maybe the RBC um, with, the, with the live group will probably potentially do that. But we want to know what or how much of a problem is this because it may not be so much of a worry. So, now, number of dogs. We talked about imported dogs. So, you've seen the number of dogs going up in total. PDSA actually do some really good review each year called Port, a Poor Report. <laughs> yeah. And this is, they were just looking at, if we go back in the data, new dog acquisitions. So, these are people taking on a new dog. In 2020, 3% of dogs were imported. That doubled to 6% in two years. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but 6% of 13 million is way over half a million. So 640,000 dogs were imported as new dogs into the UK in 2022. So this is large numbers of patients, okay? So, and if you, and that's the ones we know about. These are the ones we know about. And I think it's probably important to make a differentiation between some of these dogs, because, so um, if you were look at LinkedIn, uh, the person who put the LinkedIn comment about good breeders, she's my client, so I apologise, Ian. That was, <laughs> um, she's, uh, but she made a really good point, actually. There's some really reputable breeders in Europe actually trying to improve breed health, particularly on the brachycephalic front. Um, so there's some really great boxer breeders in Eastern Europe, in Spain, trying to breed long nosed boxers in particular, which I think we're all in favour of, and then trying to get the gene pool to change in the UK. Those people are testing their dogs to within an inch of their life for every infectious disease. So what we don't have is a, is a breakdown of how many of these are the street rescue through to proper imported breeders. Okay, and that I think is really important data to have. But we're talking about really fairly large numbers of dogs okay, coming through the door. What's interesting though, if you look at this bit of data, trans that, the number of dogs that come from alleged breeders has stayed roughly constant at 32% or so over the last, does go up and down each year over the last 10 years. So the implication is a large chunk of that 640 is dogs that are not coming from breeders. These are probably dogs that are coming from street rescue. rescue. Um, so, you know, and this is a really sad one, not many miles from Battersea. The number of dogs being rescued from UK rescue centres has dropped from 18 to 14%. So we've got way more dogs, but fewer being rehomed within the UK, which I think is really sad and not something we can control as a, as a profession. But this is definitely something where the and I won't get into the moral side of this, but um, my wife was lecturing in Belgrade a couple of weeks ago, and she was talking to some surgeons over there, and they are really worried because they are well aware that some of the dogs being rescued from Eastern Europe are all subject to criminal gang capture. They're being stripped, taken off the street, they're actually belonging to people, allegedly street dogs, they're being rescued by good, nice people over here, or being held captive, and then they have a ransom for the dogs. So there, there's an organized gang thing going on behind all this too. So there's a lot, this is a really complicated area. I'm not going to, but this is, um, I think, I'm going to try to cheer you up by that. <laughs> so, next slide, please. Now, uh, just the last bit of moraling, moral bit. This is the other thing that really worried me. Just as, I thought we'd go a little bit left field. This really scared me. And we're all worried about you know, the breeds, but the PDSA did manage to get um, some feedback on the, on, in their survey. 4% of the energy responded said that they wanted to get dogs dog abroad because they could have them with the cropped ears. And cats, it then wanted them to have declawed. Say four to five percent, but look at the numbers involved. There's 31,000 cats, the PDSA estimate, were imported into the UK in 2022 because they were declawed. So this is the, this is where I think we've got. There's a, I think that we should, as a profession, maybe it's the I don't know who does it, it's BVA, RCBS. We should be standing up saying a bit more. This is a people. There's some people out who genuinely think they're doing the right thing, genuine rescuing dogs, and they want to do the right thing. But there's a dark side to this that I think we can't be. We have to be aware of. But we're here to talk about disease. So let's look at disease. Now, 
So we're going to do some bacteria first. And this is one I think we've, I, I thought we'd do this one first, because this can be a big topic at, at London Vet Show this year about the risk of brucella. And um, brucella was something I first came across when I, I, in my previous life, I was at Dick Referrals, and we had the amazing Butty Villiers running our lab. And I remember coming run down the corridor and I was clinical and I went, oh, Rob, 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 Dr. Brucella, oh my God, what do I do? I've been touching the blood. And I went, oh my God, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you imagine having this little hot plus going on. Um, because, and this is a dog that come from Romania. Totally asymptomatic, nothing at all. But um, Butcher decided that she would start screening the dogs that were, and they'd had a travel history. And we, the first one we did, we found Brucella. Okay. Um, so, probably it's like eggs or... Hopefully it's a good revision, I know, from bacteriology. It's a little gram-negative uh, cotoxillus. And the problem with brucella is twofold. Number one, um, once infected, dogs are infected during for life, and they could be completely asymptomatic. Okay. But there is the worry that it could be a zoonosis to us. Okay. Now, I think what was really quite reassuring, the DEFRA work and, and the BVA work that's come out towards the end of last year, we think the instance is actually very low, and the risk to people, and particularly um, female colleagues, the risk to you if you were to be pregnant, you have to have probably quite a high infectious load from Brucella canis. So actually, it's probably okay unless you've got, cover yourself in blood, got a cut on your hand, but you can't be blasé about it. There is a genuine risk to us um, within this. So, um, and certainly bitches who are pregnant and then, and then whelp, the amount of Brucella they shed then is enormous. So on the placenta, on the pups, on the afterbirth of everything that's there, they are just, it's Brucella city, okay. So, um, and the, weird, the big, where are we getting them from? Brucella is endemic in Eastern Europe, particularly Romania. Where do we probably get most of our imported dogs from at the moment? Certainly in East Anglia. And my neck of the woods, it's Romania, would be the number one site. So, this was then really worried. So, there was a, a paper out in um, uh, three, four years ago, just from a reference lab, which decided they most reference labs bank their samples so they could do retrospective reviews on them. And they found that nearly 4% of dogs. Um, were positive, and they went back, they had no clinical signs at all. There was no evidence that these dogs had any evidence of disease, or the lab staff and the vets had handled this blood without thinking about it. Okay. So, um, and I think this caused quite a worry when I initially uh, presented this lecture and started preparing this in the summer, we didn't have the data that's come out later this year, where we think the incidence might be slightly lower and the infectious load that you and I would need to encounter to become infected is very high. But I would suggest, and I still think this is something you should do, if you've got a dog that is imported from Romania, you know, I actually think you have a moral obligation to probably test this dog. I think as you're doing a routine screen for something, I think we should be finding out for our public health duty to the owner. Because none of us actually ask, but actually, what if that lady is trying to get pregnant and we don't know? What if she is pregnant and we don't know? You know, what if they've got a daughter there and tell me about who's trying to get pregnant? So there is that little thing. I think it would be sensible for us to test these dogs to see what we can find. Yes. I don't think it can. No, you have to. I think it because the dog is. is put, 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 blah, 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 can, it's the dog is a terminal host, so I don't think humans can carry. But if you were, if the if a human was pregnant, then they would infect the child or the, the fetus, and they're highly likely to abort. Yeah, or cause stillbirth. So we, it, it's not pleasant. So it's a good question, actually. So I don't, if you're beyond childbearing, it probably isn't a risk, or if it's you and I, we're not a real risk because we um, couldn't transfer, uh, transfer it on. So, so um, it doesn't affect cats. So this is only in dogs. It can affect male dogs as well as female dogs. Um, and in male dogs, you get uh, sort of rip roaring um, epididymitis and uh, uh, testicular enlargement. And obviously, they, that is then infectious. So you've got an uncastrated dog that's running around that can then spread the disease as well. Um, you can also get some other just odd things. So you think about how many dogs you come in that are not quite right. They might have a little mild uveitis, mild lymph had the megaly, you know, without, okay, so my caseload is a heavy medicine case to see. Um, protein losing nephropathy with glomerulonephritis, you know, so these things can present in quite a wide variety of ways um, and not necessarily, therefore, just with, with an abortion. Okay, so this is something to just have on your mind if you've got a dog that's imported or you might have a history that's been imported, you don't know, and it's got vague signs. Disco is one thing. Disco is like an imported dog. I'm Brucella, that's probably my number one differential, actually, as opposed to being a um, Elisapelothrix or staff, which you'd normally expect in a dog that's not imported. 
Okay. So I think we've already said this. Um, so if you think you've got a diagnosis, we do need to report it um, because um, because then we've got a question of, of you know, what are we going to do? So I think so we should um, test these dogs. We're not mandated to yet. I don't know if anyone ever will mandate us to, but it does strike as being a, a sensible way forward um, to test. Yeah, yeah. The truthful uh, paper from Diane. So obviously, I think Yeah. Yeah. Is this a comparable risk? This I think probably. Well, I suppose we don't. I don't know instance of hydatid and uh, the kind of caucus in in Europe in comparison. It's probably higher than brucella, but I would say the human health risk is is. I mean, the, the consequences are potentially even more catastrophic, aren't they? So yeah, I would say it's probably fairly equal. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and human, we could get that too. So, it can be quite chronic. Something. Chronic, all acting, waning, undulating, that's yeah. a not quite right itis. Yeah. Yeah, you can get that with uh, chronic fatigue and things so with people. Really it's not, it's just that's the one that's because it can be a big thing across the board for people, yeah. So, what we don't know, and this was, the, I think, the big take home from the, from the London Vet Show meeting was. Um, De Defra, although they've done this a lot, and they say, hey, nothing to worry about, and then and there is something to worry about. Um, they genuinely are being to think the instance in the UK of the dogs are carrying it is lower than the, that 2019 paper. Well, they answer, let's go and prove it. Let's get out there and actually see what the numbers really and truly are, and then we can work out what we're going to do. So, okay. How do we diagnose it? Well, firstly, not these dogs, you'll have, if you did a routine biochem hematology, you know, then you're not going to find this an awful lot wrong. You might have a mild leukocytosis, or if the dog's got a glomerulonephritis, CRP might be up, but it's not telling you it's got brucella. You know. So um, really what we're going to be doing is you can do antibody assessment, but you actually find you, you get seroconversion antibody positive, and that is the main diagnostic test of choice. So you can do it through a slide of hallucination. Um, so, but antibody formation can be quite slow. So if the dog was... It was um, Taken from the street and imported quite quickly, now I say that politely, within a four to six week period, there is a chance it could be antibody negative it comes in, and then a month or two later it could then become antibody positive it was carrying the, the infection in the first place. Um, so, yeah, you can PCR, but PCR actually generates a lot of false negatives. So these dogs get a strong seroconversion, so serology for antibody testing is considered to be the test of choice for these patients. How do we treat it? And this is then the real problem and why I think we will have resistance from clients about testing is we can't treat it. And actually, it's the one that we really struggle. We don't have any uh, really effective antibiotic treatment. Well, we do, but dentamycin and minocycline should we really be banging these into dogs for weeks on end, which is uh, what, what we're going to be doing. Um, and there is one report of, of Batril being effective, but I'm, it's not sure. So the current advice is you get a positive dog actually, with the health risks of everything around it, should we be recommending euthanasia? Which is a, <laughs> it's not an easy conversation. I mean, actually, we've then driven the testing in the first place. So there are, treatment is possible, and there's, if, if you have one, that's the, the doses, but it is, um, uh, certainly I think it's, it's an individual case situation, isn't it? If you've got an owner who is immunocompromised or is or maybe pregnant, then I think the risks are very high. You've got owners who are really on it, understand the risks and are otherwise healthy, might be something we could consider, but I don't know where we're going to go with legislation as whether we have to treat these dogs or not in the future. So. All right. Now, moving away from Brucella, what about other bacteria? So there's some things here that, again, that we were vague memories of, maybe from vet school or not from vet school, whichever, uh, but um, probably a bit like me, you've got a large number of dogs in this area that travel over the channel, come back. So I think so a lichiosis, um, anaplasma is something now, I think, has everyone, everyone seen cases? Leishmania, I'm seeing, we're coming to that point, okay, we're coming to that in past six hundred. So, again, I think these are things that we didn't think were problems. And the major reason we didn't think these <coughs> additions were problems is that the tick that spreads these obligate and cellular bacteria is Ripocephalus, brown dog tick, which we allegedly don't have in the UK. Um, and now this is very local to me. That, so there was uh, the, the first case, we'll come on to Babesia in a minute, um, but there's a field, <laughs> there's a town in Essex called Harlow. Uh, uh, it's really sad, it's a new town, it's really economically challenged. Uh, and there was, a, there was this sort of 20 acre field that's really popular dog walking, and suddenly there was all these yellow, yellow tape over it two years ago. Don't come here, there are brown dog ticks in this field, because it had been found in the field. 
as a result of a dog being diagnosed with babesia with us at DWR. And you're thinking, it's not just in one field. <laughs> so um, we definitely have the brown dog tick now in the UK. Why do we have that? Well, it's probably a consequence of two things. Climate change, because we now have a climate that can, 20 years ago actually, we probably didn't have a climate that would accept the brown dog that could live in. Secondly, there are dogs that are getting something imported that are not being treated properly, or the treatment's not being applied, or it's not effective. So that this is almost certainly, and it may not be dogs, it might be coming from farm animals. It might be something else that's brought it in, so I don't think they're going to all dogs. But it is definitely, definitely uh, present. As far as we know, Ehrlichia and most of the cannot be um, spread by um, uh, Ixodes, which is obviously our normal tick we're all used to seeing. But there is now some evidence anaplasma might be able to be. So we'll come on to and see. So if you look at um, uh, this is uh, the cat, cat we're used to seeing. So that on this little graph, um, this is from an, an international tick survey that was published two years ago. Anything red, this is where they're endemic. So these are the ticks we all we all love, and all your plants going to Richmond Park come back and buy tick hooks off us on a regular basis. So these are ones that you'd expect to see. Okay, and certainly where most of our dogs are travelling, which are in Spain or Italy and France. Yeah, so these are things that we're going to see. The next slide. Well, sorry, you won't know, this is the brown dog tick. Okay, <clears throat> so the red, again, is where it is endemic. Okay, yellow is now where it's been found. Okay, so we're not going to say it's yet endemic, but actually if you look at that, it's all of our area. This is across southeast, East Anglia, that central belt through to Wales. Poor Wales gets lots of ticks, I know that's because there's lots of deer and sheep, but, um, and Cornwall. So yeah, why to live in Devon? So I'm, I'm Devonian, so that's what um, So, uh, but this is becoming something, and this is March 2021, and there was the paper that was uh, published last year in the vet record, look at the, the National Tick Survey, which we, most of us took part of, and we're finding it everywhere. I think there are now evidence of finding this up in Northumberland as well. We didn't have this in the UK 10 years ago, we thought, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but this is carrying disease that we didn't used to have. Okay. And this little chap, I just want, I'm not going to talk much about hyaloma, but hyaloma is a little tick which is starting to get some interest because um, hyaloma is the tick that carries hemor uh, Congo hemorrhagic fever, which is really nasty in people, but dogs can carry it too and it can affect dogs. Very, very common in Spain and across um, uh, into Morocco. I worry about this because I'm holiday in the summer. And you're fine in London, but East Anglia, Cambridgeshire, absolutely stuffed because we've definitely, definitely found it. So, um, but, so we're going to have to wait and see. This is a tick again that we didn't think we could have in the UK because actually it's not common in Northern Europe at all, but we're starting to find it. So the question is, how's this coming? Where's this coming from? Is it dogs? Is it, I don't know, but this is something we need, we need to see. Thank you. So this is um, Ehrlichia nanoplasma. This is a sort of disease where there's the names and, and terminology seems to change from uh, intermittently, from the, they're very, very similar. These are little intra, uh, oblig intracellular obligate um, bacteria and Ehrlichia is the main one. Delicia canis um, was first described actually in the Vietnam War, where they had lots of um, dogs working with the army, and they got this what we call tropical pancytopenia. These dogs are coming in just with complete bone marrow wipeout, you know, no white cells, no platelets, and a very significant and non regenerative anemia. And it was identified to be due to um, what we called at the time Delicia platis, and now we can now call it anaplasma platis. Um, and this is something that is um, very common in southern Europe. Okay, so if you go, uh, up my wife is Greek, so we get to spend quite a bit of time in Greece, and all our friends' dogs, oh yeah, they've got Kalazar, yeah, you can be treat, and it's just, it's just routine, okay, these dogs just get it on and on. Um, and it's something that we do need to watch, because particularly what our would be, most of the way we present this is not as a pancytopenia, but as a marked thrombocytopenia. Okay, so these plates are called dogs, come and look like they've got a new naked thrombocytopenia plate, we count off two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, they are particularly, they are trying to, they're a ticking time bomb, they're going to die if we don't treat them. Okay, so. Um, so this is something, again, that we didn't think we used to have in the UK at all, and it's tick-borne disease that's probably doing it. Next slide, please. Um, I said there's, oh, I was going to get into this. So the major ones, Ehrlichia canis is the one we're right about. Ehrlichia chapensis is something that we uh, certainly in, in the US, but we don't seem to see that over here at all. Um, but this is the way it's throughout the Mediterranean, but we've got phagocytophilium, which is anaplasma, which causes, again, bone marrow infections in central and northern Europe. So these are things that are out there, and if you've got dogs traveling into um, particularly Spain, Italy, south of France, these dogs are quite like to come across the vector that will potentially affect them, okay? And they can carry these totally asymptomatically for ages, ages and ages and ages. Um, now, talked about the vector, why am I worried? 
because it's this old brown dot tick again. We don't have that allegedly. Well, I've just shown the graph, the map that shows that we do. So we have a dog that is uh, totally asymptomatic, walk around my field in Harlow, um, and a tick bites it, then that's going to spread to the next dog, and then the next dog, and the next dog. So this is one of those things where you can see, in particular the summer, we're all, well, I was loving the summer last year. I know global warming is bad, but when it's warm weather, you're going, yes, yeah, it's great. But the ticks are loving it too. And yeah, the dog drought is much longer. So these, I think, are the worries. And a plasma we now know can be spread by an Ixodes as well. So maybe we'll have to see. Um, and this is probably the global warming thing that brown dog tick needs to be at six degrees or above, but it can shelter in crooks and crannies and gate posts. Where, and, you know, have we had a really nice frost? No, we've had lots of wet, warm weather. So this is um, something that's really, really worrying. So I think we might start seeing more of this over the next 10 years. We'll have to wait and see. So, what have I said there? Ah, that's the other thing, yeah. We talked about human disease. Anaplasma phagocytophilium can cause disease in people. So, you know, and um, you probably, if you've got kids, you probably are in the summer if you're around Richmond Park or you, you, you check your kids' knees and tummies for, for, for ticks. But there is a real genuine thing here. It might just not be tick bite fever with a bit of staff. You know, they might be carrying something that's a little bit unpleasant. So, this is something that we do. We don't know instance, and there's not any major outbreak of phagocytophilium in the UK, but it's something I think we need to be thinking about. So, main alichia. How does alichia present? Well, alichia is one of these diseases where if the dog, if you, if you were able to follow a course of the disease properly, the dog gets infected and it has an acute inflammatory response to the presence of the bacterial infection. So you get a little acute, they're not quite right, they get lymphadenomegaly, you know, or they may just be vague, a bit pyrexic, we'll give them some paracetamol, maybe some bit of, you know, um, rimadil, and the dog gets better. And you go, oh, I wonder what that was about. Okay. And it goes away completely. And then the dog will stay well for ages and ages and ages. Um, but the problem is it will eventually, in most cases, start to cause a problem. And what they then have, you'll get bone marrow disease. So you will get uh, sort of lymphadenomegaly, you will get thrombocytopenia, in particular thrombocytopenia. Um, you may start getting a non degenerative anemia as well. So these dogs then. So if you've got a dog and you, um, as one of them would say, if you're doing blood donor, if you're getting blood donors, create a blood donor register, this is one disease you absolutely need to screen for. Okay, so infectious disease screen, your 40X, your blood, you must do a 40X on these dogs, even if you don't know where they've come from. Um, so if you know where they come from, the best breed on the planet, you need to make sure they're not carrying this. We don't want another infected blood cycle, a scandal for dogs like we've had for people. Okay. Um, so, Chronic phase is one that's worries because this is one we're generally going to see them when they come in. We're actually really unwell. So, and they just get progressively more and more unwell. So you tend to get lethargy, weakness, pyrexia, lymphadenomegaly. They can look like a nasty lymphoma. Okay, so that's one that they will look like. Um, I mean, I did part of my residency in Colorado. And I was working in oncology. Um, and I heard this dog came in. It was really, it was a massive lymph node. So I was going, it was really unwell. There's something wrong. I've never seen it. And the uh, great Greg Overby said, just taken out, I think it's got a lickier. Really, Greg? And he was absolutely right. So it, was, you know, it wasn't lymphoma at all. So it's just one of those things. Um, but they can get, they can look like re almost like anything. I've also seen dogs that get a little bit of um, uh, conjunctival edema. So mild sort of uh, 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 uveitis, conjunctival edema, um, uh, some petechiation, all the things you just find with low platelet counts. So um, and certainly you say the eye changes there, you might see. Um, Labs, as you expect, I said, I put the anemia in the, in the acute phase, but I'm not really generally these places can be an aplastic, so non degenerative anemia. So if you measure a tick loss site count, it'll be less than 100, certainly. You'll have no um, uh, regenerative response, very few ticks, small little cells. We'll get neutropenia. So you look at this thinking this dog's got a bone marrow problem, because if you've got, they don't say general medicine lecture, but you've got one cell line down, it's probably nothing on the bone marrow. Two cell lines down, maybe a bone marrow. Three cell lines down, you've got to look in the marrow. There might be something extra medullary causing the suppression, but I'm interested thinking we might be dealing with bone marrow, so obviously what's going on in these patients. Usually though, the other thing you get, you do the body, they do try to mount the immune response. So these dogs get quite a marked hyperglobulinemia. So the other major difference for this is multiple myeloma. You've got, okay, have I got you know, a, a, a massive sort of a, yeah, plasma cell tumor in the marrow that's portioning the marrow, but then causing the globulins to go high, it could be a lichia. Okay, so this is one where, and if you do a, um, uh, if a, a protein lets you freeze this, you can get variable results because if it's a single infection, you should actually get quite a monoclonal spike. The problem is most of these dogs have anaplasma and a lichia infection at the same time, so sometimes they're polyclonal. If it's monoclonal, you'll think it's myeloma. 
Okay, so that's where you want a bone marrow sample as well. And then we can and do some antibody testing and see what we've got. Okay, so it's quite easy to work out, but they can look like that. And this is a lovely little dog, and this is um, uh, so a patient of mine from DWS about 10 years ago now, sadly. Uh, but th there's a story in this little chap. He got referred down um, from Birmingham to me at Dick White Falls to investigate uh, lymphoma. And his, his history was we imported from Cyprus, owned a film in love with him on the beach nine years previously, and brought him over, okay, from Cyprus. So um, I like Cyprus so much, so I thought it was a really nice story. I was examining him, going, why has he got conjunctival edema? You don't get that with lymphoma. That's really weird. And then we did some um, a senior, uh, ocular exam. I'm not very good, I'm not an ophthalmologist, but I, even I could see there's a little bit of retinal um, uh, hemorrhage. I think, okay, so we took some blood to show I've absolutely no platelets at all. I was thinking, this is really, really odd. Um, and at this point, it wasn't on my radar. This is 2009. You were still at school, and I'm just really bad. <laughs> he had a lichia. And he'd had a lichia completely clinically, silently for nine years. He was 10 years old at this point. What made it recrudesce was he genuinely had lymphoma as well. So the immunosuppression of the lymphoma allowed him to go, well, hey, here I go, I'm going to come and cause you a clinical problem. So he had lymphadenomegaly, he was pyrexic, um, he did have hyperglobinemia. I think, oh, he got, um, I should have had his bloods, but I'm not allowed to access any of my results. I had before, so I, I don't have the results. Um, but he had hyperglobinemia. I said, God, is this a weird B cell proliferative lymph, lymph, odd lymphoma? No, it was he had a standard B cell lymphoma um, and a lichia did actually respond to treatment. So we treated him with a CHOP protocol, um, but we put him on to uh, doxycycline first, and uh, doxycycline does work very well against lichia. So if you've got a dog, you think, if imported dog that's got no platelets, I would not criticize you to jump for the doxy, okay, because most of them will, if it's that, respond. And actually, he did go into remission. Um, I lost contact with him about nine months, but he was still in remission at that time. But the lesson from him was he had, been, he had not been out of the UK in that sense, he came back from Cyprus. At this stage, we don't think we had the brown dog tick and brown dog tick in the UK. So I don't think he could be infected from anywhere else. It's possible. He'd carried it silently for nine years. So, and then I think was a nice dog, nice owner. So, um, what's the difference between licking and anaplasma? Well, anaplasmas look almost exactly the same under a microscopy patch. It's almost impossible to tell the difference between the two. But anaplasma, which can be spread by ixodes, can cause IMPA. So anemia to polyarthritis without shifting lameness. So again, um, we actually did tell we, we was at, the, at this lovely time at DWR, it was, it was, I don't know if you know, it was me, John Ray, Simon Tappan, and Rory Bell were the medicine team. So between us, we had about 80 years of experience. And we said, have any of us, um, if you've got an IMPA patient, have any of us diagnosed Lyme disease? None of us have diagnosed Lyme disease. We all have to do a Borrelia assay for a dog with IMPA. So if I had a dog who traveled, I'd be definitely looking for doing a 4DX on these because some dogs have plasma, They'll get the thrombocytopenia, but they can also just get the shifting lameness without any other clinical signs. And I'm probably going to teach psychics, but IMPA, I think, is one of those fascinating diagnoses. And you feel like a bit of a hero. And I'm going to say, dog comes in and it's, it's just stiff and it's, it's got maybe a bit of neck pain, it's got temperature of, you know, off the scale. And you can't feel an effusion. You stick a needle in the joint and you get that yucky, watery brown stuff. You go, I know what's wrong. Um, normally you give it pred and they get better. Give this pred, it's going to go wrong. Okay, so it's, if you've got a dog that's travelled and you diagnose IMPA, I would be running a 4DX to be looking for a plasma and liquid just in case. Um, is there anything else? I think we've talked about this. Anaplasma plasma is very similar. I won't go through the same thing, it's a very similar slide. But, so we've got this little group of uh, um, intracellular facultative bacteria um, that all spread by ticks, all presented in a very similar way. And the key thing Dominant, the, the, perhaps the common thing is thrombocytopenia. Okay, that's probably the most common uh, abnormality that we're going to find. Okay. So, I'm boy, so I, I had half my residency with Butty, so I had to put a blood smear up at some point. Okay, so um, if you're it's looking for anaplasma and liquid reaction on blood smears is quite hard. Um, so, this is a little chap here. Okay, just sitting, um, it's, you know, in a, in a white cell there. So, PCR or serology. And this is one where actually we're looking at where um, Fordix is great, but actually PCR, if you've got an asymptomatic patient, is potentially going to pick up some of the infectious particles. Okay, so DNA from that. So um, it's, they do generally see a convert, so antibody testing is, is generally going to be quite good. If you're really lucky anaplasma, you can see them sitting in the middle of the neutral, but you can't tell the difference. You know, so the lab's going to tell you, you've got something inside a cell, we need to do go testing, you can't tell the difference between what, what it is and I'm going to be. 
Um, so, and also we don't think there's cross-reactivity between the lithium and nanoplasma on serology. So the antibodies are separate, so you should be able to differentiate between them. Well, all the big labs, whichever, I think which lab you're using, but um, all of the major XO reference labs will do this sort of testing quite happily for you. Okay. Yeah, these little chaps. I've never seen this. This is, of course, thank Butty for this because I've never seen one of these. So, um, so okay, I think the other thing to remember is if you get a dog and you do diagnose Ecanis or Ehrlichia anaplasma, you've got to think it's probably got more than one infection. And there's also some evidence to show that some dogs in Europe, if they've got uh, Ehrlichia, are quite likely to have uh, Borrelia, okay, because it's a common factor. So, um, again, doxycycline responsive, thank goodness. But, okay, thank you. So, how do we treat? Um, doxy. Okay, um, so just five weeks standard dose, twice a day. I would generally now treat three to four weeks regardless, I think, is what I would generally do. Um, obviously giving it the food, uh, to make sure we don't get esophagitis. Uh, and generally, if that's all they've got, the prognosis is good. If they've got something else that's made it recrudesce, it depends what the underlying lymphoma or whatever other infectious disease or yeah, metabolic abnormality it is that they've got. Um, when they present in the really chronic form, where you've got severe bone marrow infestation, those dogs can be a real challenge. Because sometimes it's hard to clear infection, but also you've got a dog that's got no neutrophils, no platelets, and they're sitting in your, in your clinic not wanting to live. So they can be really quite challenged. You may need a lot of transfusion support to get them through. Um, this is one where, would I use the platelet concentrate? Probably you're going to run out of the platelets within 12 hours to give them the platelet concentrate, and at several hundred pounds a bag. So the key is to get the treatment on board get the doxy in and support as much as you can. Um, but most of these patients will actually do quite well if you can get on top of it. Um, oh, I forgot I was going to say about cats. Yeah, um, so, <laughs> uh, so we think cats get it too, but it's, um, so if you've got, again, really with cats, cats seem much more resistant. I just don't seem to get things like this so much. Better. But if you've got, again, same sort of presentation, if you've got a cat that's not got tick prophylaxis as an outdoor cat, um, it doesn't necessarily, therefore, we think that maybe have to be imported. But if you've got a patient with lymphadenomegaly and thrombocytopenia, multicentric lymphoma in cats is unusual compared to dogs. You do get it, but it's not a common presentation. So if you had a generalized lymphadenomegaly, I'm going to be taking F and A, and let's, you probably get lymphadenitis back as, an F, as a cytological diagnosis. What's this going on? There's probably an underlying infectious cause. I'm always worried in lymphadenomegaly in cats TB, um, which we're not going to talk about tonight, but TB is definitely raw food in cats, and TB is, I worry about that. Um, but that paper, I think you read it. There's a so read the blog, I'm just read the blog. There's a Daniel Gunmore, Edinburgh. Uh, there was we had three cats at DWR that came in with um, uh, we diagnosed with TB. The owner had to, had it, the owner had TB, he needed treatment, had a pulmonary TB, and they were all fed a raw food, venison based raw food. And then that triggered a study based at Edinburgh, and there's 47 cats across the UK were diagnosed, all fed the same venison raw food, all had pulmonary TB. That's not an infortive disease, that's just a simulus disease. But that's another story. So, um, so that's our vaccine. So I think really back to the, the brucella is the one I think you need to watch this space, there's a real worry. I think the alichia and the plasma is more of a worry for the dogs than it is for us, but I think it is something that we are going to see. They're fascinating medicine cases, and generally you know, we would be more than happy to help if you have one, um, but uh, most of them can manage in practice. Okay, so but we can start. Who's the tick prevention that we use in the UK? Think, is it Lyme's disease takes about 16 hours to take to fight and transmit. Yeah. Some other diseases take about two hours. So, but a lot of them take about 16 hours to kill the tick. So, just uh, what we're using your paper based And that's the question, the answer we don't know. Right. It's a really good question. Um, the problem, the answer there probably depends on the infectious load in the tick. Okay, because we're, we're now being understand there's probably different levels of infection within each of the ticks. But there is a concern that you can transfer within 12 hours. So we should be using Bravecto to actually stop the biting in the first place. Have we got things that work well? Do the spottings work quickly enough? I think that's one of the big questions. Most of them do seem to work, but because the infection disease, when they're treated, doesn't seem anywhere as high, but I think there's a chance we could get through. So spottings are more, you think the spottings are more preventative than the tablets? Uh, I don't know if anyone's got that data. I'm just trying to, I didn't mention the tablets. You can, yeah. Browse in Switzerland, I, I put uh, the dog retreated orally. <laughs> so, yes, I'm a bit of practice of what I preach. Yeah, yeah. But I don't know if we've got that that data. Um, there are some, I know, I know vet ecology in, in Greece who would only ever swear by collars to try to just kill them as quickly as possibly can. And the Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I've heard of 
So what about protozoal disease? Let's move away from bacteria. So um, now these, okay, Giardia and Tritrix, I'm not going to talk about that. You're probably happy with Giardia. Do you have my Giardia down here? Yes. Does it, was, <laughs> are you seeing it easier to treat? I'm just intrigued now. Yes. Is it, uh, so becoming like resistant like to fenbenzol? Like 14 days. Yeah, okay. the current courses of yeah. fenbenzol. Yeah, so this, is, this isn't published, but this is something that we're talking about. Talk about the medicine groups. Oh, I need to get out. Um, but I think we're all beginning to think that, there are, that Giardia has become more just to fenbenzol. Should we use that and metronazole together? Should you use one course followed by another? Should we be actually all these dogs clipping the whole of their bums, all the back of their tail? And what we so say, if I've got a really difficult case, I will just shave the back of the dog and then shampooing everything every single day to stop them reinfecting. reinfecting. Um, but I, I'm, they are not easy to treat. I think there's going to, okay. So try tricking cats. I mean, again, that's uh, not very common, but you've got catteries who are just sick. The one I really want to talk about, I think, is leash mania. And um, leash is, um, again, it's a protocol disease. Uh, endemic in southern uh, Mediterranean, and the dog is the terminal host, and this can infect people. Okay. Now, the reason it, I'm going to mention it, but I don't think we need to worry yet, is the um, the vector is the sand fly, which at the moment we don't have in the UK, but the, at the moment is the, you know, um, I, just, I don't know, and looking at the way climatic conditions are, I am personally suspicious that in our area of England, it's warm enough, Soon that we're going to start making it survive. If you're in Scotland, nothing at Scots, sorry, but a little bit of bloody freezing, um, you're probably fine for a while. But if you go all across warm, wet, windy west, and our part of, of South, South England and East Anglia, I think it probably t could potentially warm off at some point in life for sand flies to establish, but we just don't know. So, um, and Toxoniospora, again, these things you, you well, we don't see very often, we test them all the time, don't we? And what's a positive type in a cat? No, is it 124, 164? I think this one of the things that what, what is a truly diagnostic uh, uh, type of a toxin in offspring cats. But leash is the one that I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about. So, this is what it looks like little sort of um, cigar shaped things with a flagellum on the end. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's a protozoal, a uh, bit of a little flagellum. And this is a sand fly that spreads it, so it's a good blood meal, looking at the cyanide colour. And this is the problem is that dogs are the terminal host. So they can carry it, they can be completely asymptomatic, but you've got the, the, the protozoa in, in the bloodstream. New sound fly bites, gets infected, and infects the next dog. And this cycle can carry on in a, in a very um, subclinical manner for an awful long time. It's the female sound fly, just as it is here with female mosquitoes that do all the damage to malaria. So we don't yet have it, but we might. Thank you. So where does this mainly occur in Europe? So I apologize, different colors, this is okay, but the orange is uh, where we've got, both got animal and human leishmania, okay? Um, uh, whereas if we've got, interestingly, they, in, um, <coughs> in Tunisia, they're sort of saying they've only got human leishmania, they don't have dog, which I can't believe, it's probably just don't test. If you look at then, where, where do a lot of our dogs travel? To our places, France, Spain, Italy, you know? Um, so all around the Mediterranean basin, and the whole of Greece is, is covered. We're starting our city through France, it's definitely present in Belgium. Um, so the Dutch claim not to have it, but I think that's true. I think they must have it. <clears throat> so this is something that any dog that travels, you, it, they are likely, there's a risk they might come across it. Okay, so sound fly prevention is really important. Thank you. So life cycle, as you expect, I've just alluded to this. Sound fly infected, jumps on dog, injects, uh, feeds of the dog, injects the pretty, uh, <laughs> oh, <hi>. <laughs> 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 Um, it's probably going, that's his worst nightmare, isn't it? A room full of vets. <laughs> it's like a horror movie. Um, and then, so it, it basically, and then we get the um, uh, transfer into a, a naive dog. Um, and then what happens is the, the protozoa are then engulfed by macrophages, which then an attempt, that class thing, an attempt to mount an immune response actually distributes it li liberally through the lymphatic system, which then sets up the uh, sort of chronic low grade grum grumbling infection. Okay. So, uh, it's, it's, we don't think ticks and fleas, that's no, right, in the UK, um, can, can spread leash. But the reason I'm worried about this is you probably lived it because it was in South London. There was a dog that um, was, came from the UK, um, it was in the UK, they got, uh, so this owners bought a dog from Spain, lived in the house, they then got a puppy from the UK, never traveled, okay, never ever traveled. The dog, the dog from Spain had been in the house for about three years, Start to have the megaly, became a bit unwell, and the vet eventually diagnosed leishmania. And the dog was eventually put to sleep. Six months later, 
new puppy in house developed exactly the same signs, exactly the same disease, had exactly the same diagnosis, how did it get from one dog to the other? And we don't know. No one actually knows what caused that. You know, so the question is, can it be dog to dog, very, very close dog to dog transmission? But there's no evidence of saliva transmission anywhere that we're aware of. The worry is, could there be some transfer with a tick or a flea that we haven't yet found? Now, you know, so we don't really know. Okay. How much of a problem is it? 14 to 15% of dogs in Greece, for example, are seropositive. If you do the same thing in Italy, you can probably see the same thing in Spain. So this is, this is a common infection. Actually, makes me worry when we're on the beach now. And if I, is it a sandfly or just a, a midge? Now, so there are several different forms, okay, and uh, the, the, the most common form is, say, there's visceral lichmanus where they get uh, signs on their skin. You might have seen these dogs where they get the, the cutaneous, the, the crusting on the skin and the baldness. And, and most dogs' owners who travel to Spain a lot pick it up instantly. You know, you see a little crusting losing over the top of the eyes or on the head, and they're losing weight, they're just um, not very well. But generally, weight loss can be PPD, differential PPD, and all the medicine stuff like um, and you do get epistaxis menina because these dogs can get both uh, a bit of hypertension and they can get um, vasculitis and they can get low, moderately low platelet counts. Okay, so they get multiple things. But again, they look potentially like a not very well lymphoma. Pyrexic, lymphadenomegaly, uh, splenomegaly, particularly big, after a big spleen. Um, and I had a lesson to this when I was working with the great Dick White and uh, we, were, we had a, used to work at Bayswater as well at Dick White Fells and with Mike Gordon's practice. And Dick said, oh, Rob, I've just taken a spleen out of a dog. It was enormous. How have you, Dick? Guess what came back on the history a week later? And I was having spider panic. It was full of this menu. Um, and there's another story about that for another season. He's done it to me twice. But um, we, can, we can laugh. So, but the skin signs and the lymphadenomegaly megaly are the major classic things you'll see. And so these are taken from uh, these pictures now. Um, from, yeah, come on, next slide, thank you. So this is, a, yeah, that I think is the sort of more classic thing you're going to see. So periorbital alopecia crusting of the skin, non pruritic unless there's a secondary bacterial infection. And some of these dogs will get a secondary bacterial infection, um, but some of them will just get really marked. Now, how will you let your dog get to that state? I don't know. Um, so, and some, though, will just present with generalized alopecia. And I'll challenge you next time you are in Greece, Spain, Italy, um, you know, and you see a street dog, I bet you'll find one if you look hard enough. You know? So, um, and that some that I've seen are just little tiny I see dogs with little tiny bits of just crusting alopecia just over the top of the eyes. So it's a periorbital alopecia and crusting is, is a classic presentation. How are we going to find a diagnosis? So you've got dogs come in, it's got lymphadenomegaly, it's pyrexic, you think it's not very well. Obviously, you've got lymphadenomegaly, you're all going to stick a needle in lymph nodes because they've been lymph nodes, it's been large, should have a needle stuck in it. Um, but you're then going to probably run some bloods. And these patients will often have a polyclonal hypergammaglobulinemia. Uh, gamma, okay. Um, but they'll have a corresponding hypoalbuminemia, so you get a negative acute phase protein response. Some of these dogs will look, you can get really marked renal damage with, with leachmania. So some of these dogs will present really quite um, azotemic with proteinuria, they'll have a low platelet count. So it's not specific. All you're going is, it's not very well. It's not definitely, that's on its own, it's not a definitive diagnosis. But you should be able to pick up antibodies. Okay, and antibodies generally, generally see a convert within two to four weeks, uh, but PCR. Is, is the way because these things, because you've got the protocell that be present in the body, you can pick up the infection even if it's uh, subclinical on PCR. Okay, and you can PCR blood, you can PCR bone marrow. So I'd be happy you know, to do either. Um, if you're lucky, you see these chaps, which I don't know, look like I don't know, tiny butterflies. I don't know how you describe those. Um, space invaders, some of they look like, for those in the and I's age. Um, but this is something you can pick up, and it's, it's, it looks like nothing else really. On, this is on lymph node aspects. Um, and you see the same on bone marrow. Okay, so you think it's not the inflammatory, but you'll see those quite easy. And this is just on the game sustain. Just one of the. Was that a. What's the slide on the left? Sorry. Okay, come back. What were the other cells? So, oh god, now, next. So you've got these are plasma cells. Okay. So they're plasma cells because you've got that lovely royal blue cytoplasm. Um, I'm not sure what that is. They're all. Yes, and that is this one bone marrow, so that's a nucleated red. Yeah. Yeah, no. Well, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? <laughs> that would have been interesting. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Now, um, is anyone treated fish? Yeah, so probably teach the psychic. So, um, again, this is one of these things where most of these dogs actually will respond quite nicely. Can we completely eradicate the infection? Probably not, but we can make it something they actually do really, really well with. Um, and 
which you use, I think, depends on what experience you've had, if you've worked abroad, um, but most uh, megalamine and allopurinol, I think, is what we've generally gone for. Um, I've seen now quite a few colleagues go from miltifosin with allopurinol, um, and uh, yeah, whether that's better or not, there's one paper suggesting miltifosin might be better than me um, megalamine antimonate. Um, but and the biggest thing, obviously, megalamine can be nephrotoxic for a dog, dog who's already acetemic or has got uh, glomerulonephritis and proteinuria. You may want to be going towards miltifosin, and you basically go for loading dose and a maintenance dose. And so most of these dogs do very, very well. Um, the worry, obviously, with things like megalamine is it's not cheap. And I had a client who it was cheaper for her to jump, to, go to Stance, to jump a plane, go to Spain, and pick it up from her vet in Spain and bring it back. That was cheaper than us providing it. So, and let's not get into the licensing. This was pre-Brexit, when we, when we could do that. So, um, allopurinol, I, there's always worry about it can cause xanthan crystal. I've used quite a bit of allopurinol, I, I, I've never had problems with it, but you do need to be doing, if you've got a dog on long-term allopurinol, you want to be doing some urine microscopy um, or a fresh sample within a couple of hours, avoiding you know, every month or so, just make sure you, that the dog is okay. Another thing though, and I don't know why it's going to color, I can't think of this, um, Domperidone. Uh, which you might be using as, a, as, a, as an um, anti-nausea, okay? There is now some evidence that this actually works quite well, okay? Because you actually stimulate immune response that might actually help clear the infection, okay? Um, and it, there is now been license um, in the States um, for this, so it, don't, it hasn't been licensed, I don't think, in Europe. Um, and I don't know if anyone's done any combination studies of miltifosin and domperidone, allopurinol and domperidone. I'm sure someone's doing it somewhere. Um, but this is something to, that maybe cheaper, easier, and maybe useful to use in the future as well. So um, I think it's potentially something that would work very well. I'm happy to share these slides more. We can do it through, if that's right, Lydia, yeah, we can, we can certainly share the slides without problem at all. That's what, I knew someone else. I don't know, Annabelle, I've, um, I've not found it, but it really makes you wonder anything where you, you want to improve your response if you've got, um, I mean, it makes you think about FIV, FLV in cats, because we were in that. Um, so uh, patients with a severe neutropenia, can we actually help them through that? Yeah, I don't know, it's a really good question. I can, I'll, I'll do some reading, yeah. I haven't found anything, yeah. So, thing with leash, can't cure them, but actually generally with treatment, they'll do okay. Okay, and if we can then keep them out of somewhere, that, well, out of an area where there's a vector, I, in theory in the UK, it's just a case of managing relapses. If there's no vector, the risk of the human is pretty much zero. If they're traveling backwards and forwards, um, or if they're in a country where their vector is present, then obviously there is a potential risk that to the owners and anyone else in the household, but no more than because it's probably endemic in their area. So it may not be their dog that's the problem. If they get renal disease, that's a problem because normally getting a genuine glomerulonephritis, massive holes punched through the glomerulus. So you're going to have persistent proteinuria that we're not going to resolve, and those patients don't do anything as well. Now, the other one that fascinates me, the Bezia. This is the Harlow dog. Um, so um, Babesia causes immune-mediated hemolytic anemia. This is a uh, protozoa that will infect red cells, and then you get an immune-mediated response against the protozoa inside the red cell, which the body accidentally damages red cell in the process. So it's trying to do its best, but actually causes a rip or an IMHA. Um, but it's, it can also, there's a form of Babesia where it's just got this chronic grumbling, waxing, waning. So it's a, one of these odd ones where is probably the immune response in the individual patient as to determine how the disease actually manifests. Maybe, it's maybe even subdivisions or um, subspecies of the disease that we haven't yet identified. So this is something, again, that's spread by ticks, and in particular, uh, the Dermacenta and Ripocephalus, so ones we didn't have. Um, and this is the one that we say, the, the famous dog in, in Essex, where they went, we diagnosed the babesia, then the owner went back, reported it to the ministry, and they went, mm, let's go looking, and they then started finding it, found the tick. And then we're now finding this is probably present across large swathes of the UK. So this is, um, uh, this is not from a specific dog. So this is normal red cells, well, sort of normal red cells. You see we've got little tiny intracellular um, blobs. That's not stain precipitate because that's, um, that's how they are. So this is what it looks like. And imagine if you, you've got a little bit of um, any of the protocell protein on the outside of the red cell, then you get a mild, marked antibody response. You get uh, attack complex coming into it, of course, cell lysis, but then that's MHA. So, you know, these are challenges. And this is a little chap, that's the center, that's what it looks like. So, could say they're quite pretty, really, couldn't you? But um, not what you want to find on your dog. Okay. Now, we didn't talk about dermocenter, so this again is uh, where does this tick, particular tick, where we know it's the brown dog tick? This is actually Devon 
No, no, yeah. I think it's I think it's not true. It must be Cornwall. It must be Cornwall. <laughs> so if you if you're not from the South West, Devon Cornwall, get you I go it. Um and it's Essex. So that's fine. It doesn't matter if it's Essex, does it? <laughs> but we've got again this tick is is present across vast swathes of Europe. Okay, so um so that and uh, with Ripocephalus, then I think this is something we are gonna start seeing more and more of as time has gone on. And if you compare this map to what we had in twenty thirteen, there's no red in the UK. Now, is that because we didn't know we weren't looking? Was it truly a change in instance? The answer is probably a bit of both. But this is something that's changing. And I think the idea that these ticks are only in Essex, Devon, and Wales, um, I can't, that, that's not true. <laughs> it, was my, it was my humble opinion. So, is it about Babesia? So, tick bites, the effects of the dog, the protozoa run around the bloodstream, they will gain entrance to the red cells, and that can take anything from two to four weeks before you start getting any evidence of immune response. Um, and the issue of this, this does need long, long tick um, transmission. We know that. So for why that's different, we're not sure. And then you get an asexual reproduction, and then you get a marked uh, IMHA event as, as a response. And these patients can be really tricky because they will be burning through every red cell they possibly can. And the higher the infectious burden, the more the damage to the red cells. And obviously, what we, we've got to the suppress them because it is a, these will start getting a. a Antigen association, so where you start getting um, immune mediated damage to the antigens immediately adjacent to the protozoa. So it's not just destroying the babies, you get a true IMHA against red cells as well. So we do need to think about treating them with a cyanide but you don't want to immunosuppress them without treating the, the babies at the same time. So they can be really quite a big challenge. Okay. Um, we can diagnose both by antibody or with, so obviously, a serology, ELISA, or PCR. If you want to pick them up really early, which you're not going to, you don't know them well, PCR would be the way to do it. You've got a clinically relevant case, they're going to be antibody positive. Okay, because we've got the antibodies against red cells causing the IMHA. So quick, simple, 40X to get that up. Okay. So, good news, it's treatable. Okay, and I don't, but there's a little size of waiting. Um, imidacarb is the drug of choice. You give it a subcutaneous injection, um, 14 days apart, and they generally respond really well. And this was the other classic, that's some dick bite case, it was only, I can't say it was, but a very famous, very um, Asian violinist who's very small, if you've met her, an amazing violinist, but it's her dog. She had this um, a nightmare sharp A. God, it was an aggressive little shite. And uh, I saw it at Bayswater, and so Dick took the spin out and then came around and go, oh, there's a couple of these here. And if you splenectomize these dogs, you tend to get a huge um, blood presence of anemia, and they normally, they are in real trouble. So do not splenectomize a dog that's got babesia. I've got Vanessa May's dog in front of me. At the time, she was super, super, super famous. I'm going, oh my God. Fix the thing, spin out. What I didn't know with the carb is it makes them salivate like mad. So I've got this nightmare aggressive Sharpe. So I give it a sub injection. I don't know if you've been to Mike Gordon's surgery, it's a tiny little, tiny little waiting room. I walked out to him later, the entire waiting room was just covered with this really aggressive dog saliva everywhere. And she was just sitting there really not naked and mild. Is this normal? <laughs> anyway. We've got the dog right, and um, she travels. So, so they generally they can be treated, but in these patients, you give them if you get a positive diagnosis, treat them in the car, but you've probably got to give IMHA treatment as well. Okay, so you've got to, and they may they're going to be almost certainly transfusion dependent for a while when you're first treating. Okay, so they will certainly at least high likely one. Um, so, and most of the ones we see are large babesia. I said before, there's these little babesia of um, Gibson eye, and they are a little harder to treat. There's a Hold this. I've never treated one, so this is just taken from textbooks. So I think we can do, um, but they again, if you get on top of it, any dog that's traveled IMHA, any dog that's had tick exposure, I've got an IMHA, I will now do a quick ELISA for Babesia. That might be overkill, maybe it's a referral population. Um, but if you've got imagine your tick population in Richmond Park, probably fairly high with a deer, um, it, oh, the cost of quick. Uh, serology, I think it's worth doing just in case. Certainly, the dog traveled, it might be an IMHA. And Butch and I would talk about this, and we would actually, I never know it's overkill. Should we just test them all for IMHA? Because probably it's going to be one in a hundred. But if you miss it, then it's going to be a problem. If you've got a good pathologist, yes. Right. So, and that's how we picked up this dog who had Butterbillias going. But yeah, so if you. Um, and the interesting with digital microscopy, has anyone got, actually, I've got, has anyone got the Zoetis Imagist? I'm just going to go, yeah. Mm. So I'm interested, so, because I'd actually bring that digital microscope for practice later this year. Um, but you make a, you don't make a smear. You put the, the, the sample in suspension. I still don't know how this is going to work. 
But I'm just intrigued with Zoetis' images. I talked to him on Monday about this digital microscopy um, where it's AI driven. So it will do your cytology for you. If you're not sure you like the results, they'll ping it to the States. They've got 80 board certified pathologists, some of them in the UK. And I think it comes, if the quality of the smear is good enough, I think it'd be good. But it comes down to how good your smear is. And BPG are looking to bring in something later in the year as well. So I think that would make a big difference. Yeah, I digress. Um, okay, thank you. Hmm. Soon as. Yeah, so. No, no, no. I would give the first dose of the carb and I'm in with the Fred. Yeah, straight away. Because you need, you can buy a. So I. Depends on how well the dog is. If it's. I'm. This isn't I'm actually actually. I'm actually. Uh, if, if your dog sort of walks in. So I. If I'm transfusing, I won't transfuse based on PCB. I'll transfuse on how the dog is. So you've probably seen those chronic IMHAs. And I have this dog that ran in. It was a Springer. I'm not a big Spanish fan. A uh, PCB of seven, and it was bouncing around the waiting room, going, You've been in it for weeks. <laughs> I'm not going to transfuse that dog. The dog that comes with a PCV of 15 that can't stand, that's just absolutely, then I'm going to transfuse that dog because it probably ignored where took out 24 to 48 hours previously, and it's just gone from zero to Everest Base Camp 2 you know, in, in 24 hours. So, in these patients, I would think about doing, if they need transfusion based on clinical signs, I'm going to hit them with some. Pred or Dex, whichever is good, right? There's no better Pred or Dex is if the dog won't eat. Um, Dex is equipotent. Um, and get the imidacarb in as soon as you can. Uh, just an AMHA question. Yeah. Are you using it more like a like, 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 oh, I know oh. it's going to be a big one. Um, no, no, it's not. It's, I, know, I, I, I did the bicycle on it today. So. <laughs> um, I do, but not necessarily the first time. And I think it's so there is a, if you have insomnia, that, um, Annabelle's read this, so maybe well. There's a really good consensus article from, from in Javin on diagnosis of IMHN and what the treatments are. And if you go, it was 2019, I think. If you go through that, the only treatment that always is most consistent with is, is, is PRED. Uh, you know, and on that, I I do worry about doses. Two moves per kg once a day, you do not need to go above that dose. You don't need twice a day, you don't need three moves per kg. The two moves per kg is in the suppressive. If I've got, a, and I won't go over 50 mg total dose. Big dog, I have put a dog up his back legs. And if you go over two mg per kg in a, in a 50 kilo dog, it probably won't be walking in three days' time. So I would not, my ceiling dose is around 50 mg. Um, I generally, and I have to be honest, I will often do prednisopharaprin at the beginning. And I do that because I do two mg per kg once a day for a week and then every other day thereafter. You do azopharaprin every other day. I've never seen immunosuppression and bone mass suppression with that. I've seen dogs, uh, quite a number of dogs that have had IMHA, the vets done a great job, predisotharpin, give azoprin every day. And three months later, they come back being anemic. It's a non ingestion and usually cause bone marrow shutdown. They resolve quite quickly when you stop the azoprin. Azoprin every other day, I've never had a problem with. Uh, that's the combination to do. It's cheap, it's, it's cheerful. Pregnant people can't handle azoprin. That would be anything I'd be worried about. Um, is it better than cyclosporine? Is it better than mycophenolate? No one's proven that. I have used mycophenolate quite a bit. I've used mycophenolate more in cats, actually, in the immunity disease. I've bizarrely had a lot of cats with immunity neutropenia that don't respond to PRED. You can't give them azotharpin. Cyclosporin was really expensive, so when it's mycophenolate, it's now gone up in price, and they responded brilliantly. And the dogs I've given uh, mycophenolate to tolerate it really, really well. I see fewer GI side effects than I have with cyclosporin. You're then that dilemma on Cascade that actually cyclosporin is licensed, mycophenolate's not. If you've got a reasonably sized dog and you can get on prescription, mycophenolate is going to be significantly cheaper and it works. So um, I generally go predazotharpin. If I'm worried, I'll draw, draw in mycophenolate and replace this azotharpin. You can't use the two together. You could use pred, azot, and cyclo, um, but I'd do pred and then put, draw the mycophenolate in. The other thing I say is on the BSA very formulary, which actually was the vice school, <laughs> I, got, I said, I'll just stop the azotharpin. And there was this massive panic. And the formula says, you can't do that, you can't do that. And it's, Nonsense, actually. The reason you can't stop acetharpin suddenly is in human medicine, it's when you use daily at higher doses and you're, you're having an immune disease. So if you stop it suddenly, the immune disease is likely to come back. If you use it every other day, then the plasma dose in our dogs is low. And if you stop it, if it's going to relapse, it'll relapse. There's not a dangerous thing of stopping acetharpin, it's just the disease might relapse. So I, I know the others are quite well, I need to chat them with them. I think that's bad advice in the formula. I don't think there's a big problem stopping it. But that's why I do. I do pred, and I do my Sanopred is and I'm probably overkill here. I think somebody, I would do two mix per kick once a day for a fortnight, mix per kick once a day for a month, 
half move gig, half move per gig once every month, then half move per gig every other day thereafter of three months. So I treat for six months total. Then I'll, then I'll just wean the pred down. I'll have the ACES up and run alongside it two moves per gig every other day. I've never had pancreatitis in a dog on that dose either, because that's in the form is it causes pancreatitis. I don't think it does. Is that right? Uh, Clopidogrel with the other one. Let's, let's go there. Have we got time? I don't, I don't, I don't, the other one's going home. I'm, I'm just going to go I'm just seat on the train. Um, uh, the thing that kills most dogs in MHA is thrombi. And it's one of those things that I, I, know, I managed to avoid this the first 10 years of my career. I never saw thrombus in my life. And then these people come on, and then you start seeing them. So um, the dogs in MHA are absolutely hypercoagulable, definitely. And uh, you get little micro. Uh, clots with platelets, then the damage red cells to stick to. So there is now some, re there is good evidence that clopidogrel, certainly the first four to six weeks, markedly reduces risk of pulmonary thrombosis. Um, and if the platelet count's normal, then there's no worry about causing a uh, you know, bleeding as a primary a coagulation problem. So I would put a dog on clopidogrel now for the first four to six weeks as well, definitely. I don't heparinize because although heparin theoretically makes more sense, you've just opened a whole nightmare of monitoring. You know, if, is it right? Is it wrong? Get the thing. So, and clopidogrel has been shown to work nicely. So, that would be my standard combo: Aza, Pred, and clopidogrel. Cats just Pred, but in cats with MHA, there's normally an underlying cause. So, go looking for the underlying cause. What's causing it? If you can't find anything, I'd do Pred and probably my in a cat. But all right. Okay. Um, so yeah, a bit easier. Generally, do well. Just don't take the blinking spleen out. Be my yeah. All right. Next slide, please. Yeah, there's not much on viruses, um, but this is, um, I guess, the one we're worried about is, is rabies. Um, and uh, actually, a big shout out here to World uh, Wildlife Spectrum Services. And, uh, if you notice, know, uh, Luke Gamble's charity, um, the man should have a knighthood. And I'm, I don't know very well, he's bonkers. He, he was at Cambridge with me. Um, but he's, um, he has managed, he's, he's made it his life's mission to rid India of rabies. And he's slowly going around state, and he's actually managing to really massively reduce it. So um, Mission Rabies is a charity that I'm trying to think it's, it's amazing what he's trying to do. Um, so it's definitely, definitely worth you know, supporting. Um, we know this, uh, um, obviously, uh, I had to get a little bit of Greek in here tonight. I can't speak very good Greek, as Jackie will tell you, but I'm trying to learn. Um, but this is something that is, uh, it is still present. Um, not, we don't have much of it in mainland Europe. It's where the vaccinations work brilliantly. And, um, they, they, used to, they put the, the um, uh, inactivated vaccine fox in chicken heads and dropped them in helicopters. And that's how we've managed to almost completely rid rabies in northern Europe because the foxes go and eat it. And the interesting though, the bats can carry it. So you will see case reports of bats that get across the channel um, and they might find rabies, but it doesn't seem to be a problem for us at the moment. Um, but obviously the biggest, but it is endemic in the far east of Europe. So in, in Romania, this is still a problem. So rabies is still present. So this is something, hopefully a problem. And also Morocco. So we're talking about Moroccan dogs here. Um, so it, it is a kind of something that you will see repeatedly reported in Spain, the dogs getting over um, Gibraltar Strait. So it's, I think you all know this, something you taught, it's, it's a really weird virus. It's got a marked neurotropism. So on the bite site, it will get into the nerve and it travels up the axon. Okay, and in that phase, you, um, so after the initial damage to bite, the patient is normally completely asymptomatic. So you'll keep traveling up, keep traveling, and get to the CNS, and then that's when we get all the clinical signs related to it. Um, and you get ultimately death from, it's a pretty horrible death actually, visual you'll die of tetany, um, just a massive uh, convulsion, so it's really very unpleasant. And generally it's about two weeks afterwards. So, and really sadly in countries it is present in, the people who get the most bites are children from street dogs. So, it's, um, so hopefully not something we're gonna see. Um, and I remember this is called, I was a kid, I, said, I think it was something with like Z cars or some really weird old Saturday night TV and there was a dog that had rabies. I was scared stiff all dogs, I was about seven years old, dogs have rabies. I lived in Devon, so lots of people come from boats and they get all the um, So most of these dogs, they will get the, uh, so they become just, that's really scared, photophobic, they don't think they're aggressive, they're not really, they're just scared stiff because they just can't control eyes, they're you know, really hyperesthetic, um, and they'll seizure and death. Um, and then sometimes you get this dumb form. So hopefully this isn't something we're going to see in the UK, but it's something just to be aware of. A dog that's come over from Europe that suddenly changes. And I think it's something we don't think of very often. The dog that suddenly starts showing different clinical signs, neurological signs. Has it had poison toxins? 
don't get me started on toxin. I always go, everyone says to me, the difference is toxin. What toxin? Because toxins do very specific things. Um, but if there's a sudden change and you know the dog's travelled, then it has to be in the back of your mind to differential. It's highly unlikely, um, but it's, it's possible. Okay. And I just wanted to, um, who want to? 10 out of 10, who, who's this chap? I don't know. This is Louis Pasteur. And so we all think of Louis Pasteur as being the person who gives us milk that doesn't go off, okay? But actually, his, probably his biggest contribution to science was he was the guy who did the first vaccination against rabies. Um, there's a um, brilliant podcast we used to have in my kid, one of those talking books for the kids. And it's the only thing we've got the kids who are interested in science. We have the story about Louis Pasteur, that there was a boy who'd been bitten and uh, he managed to develop an anti-serum um, and cured that boy. And then he uh, managed to, a man got bitten, he stopped him, and that was the, my, this vaccines work, anti serums work, and it's, uh, I think it'll make, they, they just don't make people like this anymore. They, if you look at actually what they managed to achieve in their life, it's, it's phenomenal. So, um, but there we are. So, how do you diagnose? Obviously, it, um, it really, it, it's going to be on, on post mortem. Okay, you can do a PCR, but it's post mortem. Um, and vaccines work. And I guess the only question we've got is, you know, hopefully, you're not in the UK, but we any, any of you rabies vaccinated? No. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It's whether it should we as a, <laughs> okay, so anyway, hopefully you won't see the option of that. I just I have to make sure. So, big thing to think is this: that any think about dogs, if there's a sudden change in behaviour, neurological change within two to four weeks of coming back from travel, if there's a history of being bitten or having involved in a dog fight, then it is absolutely on the radar. Highly unlikely to be something we'll ever see in our career. Hopefully, that's something that should be done. Okay. Now, my last little uh, uh, sort of um, thing to think. So parasites, well, we're all thinking about, you know, take worms and, uh, and ground worms, but I think the one that is starting to worry me a little bit um, is proper heartworms, not Angela Strongulus, not the one that, you know, we get from snails, okay? This is proper heartworm, which um, this is something most of the data we get is from the States um, because heartworm is endemic throughout the whole of America. This is a large ground worm that lives in um, the right ventricle and up into the pulmonary artery, okay? so. And this only really came to light because I, I was who it is, but a really good friend who was a cardiologist at Willows. And I was chatting with him last year and he said, oh, Rob, I've, I've seen about a dozen cases this year. But they've come in with over congestive heart failure. I actually we should have talked to Moodle. I don't know how many advice things we've had. And they, they get congestive, right side of congestive heart failure because the pulmonary artery is stacked full of the, uh, of the um, there's just no space. And you alter them and you can see, oh, wiggling around. <laughs> And the way you treat them, you can literally pull them out. You do a venotomy and you, get force and you literally pull them out and then treat the dogs. Because if you kill them all as adults, then you get massive thrombotic disease and massive pulmonary thrombi. So probably fascinating. <laughs> so um, now the worry is that this is something where now certain countries in Europe are starting to say that diarophilaria is, is endemic as well. And the real worry ones is, is this little group here. Okay, because we're seeing it, the dogs have traveled. Um, and initially, there was one case report review at the end of a really interesting subcutaneous form of diarophilaria in Scotland. So maybe Scotland does get infectious disease. Um, but this is something that cardiologists are starting to see in dogs imported in from Europe. Not in large numbers, but it's enough that people start to go, hmm, have you seen one? And most cardiologists will say yes now, which is worrying. If I said, ask that question five years ago, I think five years ago, I think only if I've been to the States. Okay. In the States, heartworm preventative, you probably read, there's an American Heartworm Society. Almost every dog in the States is on regular heartworm preventative. It's just one of those routine things. It's like us giving a, a gruntle. They're all heartworm preventative. Okay. <clears throat> so this is what they look like. They are, I mean, this is obviously not a patient who didn't do very well. Uh, um, but this is the little microfilaria that you can pick up on blood smear. Um, and then we'll turn into full on, on adult worms. And the thing is, they're spread by mosquitoes. Okay, so this is a mosquito bite. Um, and it, it is a sexual uh, replication phase within a mosquito. Dog gets bitten, so this is something that you know, the dog's not even going to notice, owner's not going to notice at all. And the dog is the definitive host for diaphoralaria imitis. Um, and it can be you know, quite a long life cycle, and these patients can be asymptomatic for years as their burden grows and grows. Okay, so this is something they can have, and then it could be two, three, four years after they're imported, but actually they start getting a signs of obstructive disease, but it's because their disease burden has grown the number of these things just replicating and replicating. So we don't think the mosquitoes we have in the UK can transmit it. We don't think. But we said that about blue tongues. Okay. So um, 
Mm, well, I think, wait and see. The number, of, we don't know the number of dogs in the UK that had it. I've been trying to look up this up this week. Has anyone got any data? How many dogs have died? I can't find any paper, any report that says how many dogs have actually been seen. I think that's probably a fault of specialists. I think it's something we should be, neither has got enough on the plate, but whether we should, you know, should we get people to go, go, how many have we actually seen, guys? You know, is this, because if it's three, fine. The people are just exaggerating at conferences. But I suspect people are starting to see this a little bit more often than, than you may be worried. I said, so back to a bit like Lishmania, a bit like the Aliki we talked about before, they can be, come over, be totally asymptomatic for ages. Um, but it's, if you've got a dog that has um, exercise imported, that has signs potentially consistent with the right side of the cardiac uh, problem, cough, exercise intolerance, weight loss, you know, reduced exercise ability, um, uh, collapse, congestive heart failure, then it would be on my list. And there's lots of other things on the list as well. I'm not saying it's the first you jump for, but it is something that we certainly wouldn't have had on the list five years ago, but I would have it on now. Um, so, now I'm rubbish at Echo, all of you being on. I've had someone to do this for you for 20 years, so I'm, not, I'm hopeless now that I'm But what we're going to find, if you good at radiography, you would see size increased size of pulmonary trunk, so we need to do orthogonal radiographs. Um, and actually, you see the damn things in echo. And there's something there's really hyperechoic, wiggly things where they, they should be nice, normal flow. Um, and if you're doing uh, microscopy on your blood smear, you might be lucky enough to pick a microfair on blood smear. Okay. Elisa's will tell you. Um, Elisa, so, I say, generally, if you've got a clinical infection, Elisa's should be probably nearly 100% accurate. In very early infections, so if you screen your dog that's been reported, it, then it may come up and they can get a false negative, but generally, it shouldn't be. So how are we going to treat? Well, if you've got a, if you've got a patient that doesn't have overt right-sided failure and obstructive disease, the doxycycline and some like ivermectin, salamectin actually is considered to be effective. Okay. The worry is, and there's the, the which we've got, the worry is obviously that you might end up getting massive um, parasite death and then thrombi thrombotic development around that. So these are difficult patients to manage sometimes. If you've got overt, um, so then actually literal physical removal, um, going down the vena cava, turning left and breaking them all out. Apparently it's quite good. For, I probably would enjoy that actually. It's about as close to surgery as I get. Um, so, so I, and I think, let's say, I, I'm just raising it as a question. We don't think this could be transmitted in the UK. We just don't know. But will, will our native mosquitoes know, transmit this at some point if we get all the change in mosquitoes? Don't know. They've not been challenged by this disease before. Um, and if 1%, 1% of those 640,000 dogs are infected. Okay, that's still 64,000 dogs that might be carrying this. That at some point could be a problem. Don't know. Now, this is a little interesting thing. This is um, uh, Frontiers of Veterinary Science. Okay, I know I'm a bit of a geek. It's quite an interesting journal, actually. I've seen really quite interesting papers in it. And this was a, um, a little dog that, again, similar sort of story. And there's a pattern here that a dog imported, seemed absolutely fine, gradually developed clinical signs over every period of time. And this dog developed a little raised uh, lesion on its nose with plain. And uh, the vet says did a really nice job. They, um, uh, they FNA'd it and it just came back as an odd inflammatory. They thought it was a mast cell tumor, which I think is probably a fair bet. So um, uh, they wormed it because they realized it hadn't been wormed and it kept growing and growing. And then they FNA'd it again. It was a mucoparent inflammatory response. So they gave it some antibiotics. Again, all very logical. Is there a front body in there? Um, and eventually they took it out. Thought, well, this is a mass here, let's take, don't know what this is, let's take it out in case we're missing a tumor. And they found the nematodes inside. So this actually had the, yeah, a bit, bit grim, they were dead by this point, so it's been informally. Um, and so there is this subcutaneous form of diaphanaris. It's, it's a heartworm that doesn't go to the heart, it's a heartworm that goes on the skin. And they, this has been reported in, um, uh, in the States quite often. And what's interesting is there's then subsequent to this, this uh, looking back at literature, there were two pa patients in Britain. Same history, so in England, reported to Romania, completely and then developed just cutaneous nodules, which were then found to have this in here. So it's not a major problem. The dog was completely clinically fine, but it just was that worry. Well, this is something that we've I'd never heard of for this paper, and this dog came from Romania, and something that we were going that we might see. So I wouldn't have it. So there we are. I think three slides to go, Chuck. So no, I hope I haven't depressed the hell out of you. I hope it's been helpful. Um, I'm a huge fan. I, I, you know, uh, of, of training the dogs. It, uh, one of the best holes I've ever had in my life was take the dogs to Switzerland in the summer, and it was just just awesome. Right? It's, it's a lovely little thing to do. Um, I think, and but the number of dogs going through the channel tunnel is enormous. 
kind of can we keep up to that? Are people truly doing what we're asking to do for certification? You know, my experience is your quiz like crazy on the way out. Yeah, not quiz that hard on what's in the car on the way back. I think it's really easy to bring your dogs back to that and one check in. I think even my, my experience. Um, Bam dog tick though is definitely in the UK. Right, it's definitely there. So there's a combination of more dogs traveling backwards and forwards, more imports from particularly Eastern Europe, some of which will be brilliant dogs, some of which are probably sourced questionably ethically, and some certainly will be carrying disease that we don't know and they're not tested. And we've now got ticks and things as well. So I think this is something that is something that might be a problem. Leash and heartworm can definitely um, uh, transfer to humans, but unlikely. So a brucella, I don't, I'm not really sure. So from, to answer the question I said at the beginning, is it a Trojan horse? The answer is, my personal answer is, I think yes. It's not that the troops are about to burst out and take down the city of Troy, but I think it's something that we need to be a little bit more mindful of. And um, I hope, I think Brucella has made the profession wake up a bit to, hmm, maybe there is a problem here uh, that we need to watch. We need to just try to gently educate clients, which I know is a hard enough thing, uh, but it's something what to do. I want to add one last bit of controversy, or not, because I just want to put a question out to you. So the solution, surely, if we give every tick and everything we've got, every spot and everything we do, let's get rid of the, t the, the treatment of the, the patients. This week in the vet record, you know, actually it is crystal, crystal clear. I say, I think we can make crystal clear something. There is becoming the point of overwhelming evidence that a lot of the spot-ons that we prescribe every day are actually causing huge environmental damage. And I don't know, current government couldn't organise a peer in a rural, could it? But will this change? Will we actually have legislation soon? It's not just us, it's mainly farmers actually. You know, they're that stuff from the spot ons for, for cattle um, rather than doing sheep dips. But have we got a really interesting paradox coming? That there's a simple solution to this is we, we educate clients to do really good anti pesticides, really good and all the preventatives, encouraging preventive healthcare programs. But we might have them taken away or we might have to be much more responsive to their use. Then I think we've got a problem. And this has just been going around in my head. Ever since I said I'd do the talk, like, how should I present? I don't want to say you can't present, uh, but I'm just not sure. Uh, I think it's something we need to be careful of and monitor. Whether drug companies do something, we need new products, probably, is the answer. But I don't know if there's anything in development. So it could be an interesting crux that's going to come away in a few years' time of what we're going to do. All right, one more slide, if I may. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you for coming your evening to come and listen to me. I can't, my wife would say there couldn't be anything worse than come to listen to me for an hour and a half. Uh, so um, Ian, Francesca, Annabelle, thank you so, so much for inviting me down. Um, I've loved working with you. Um, and you two doing a nice role, but yeah, it's been a real privilege. Um, and you are, having now seen this place, oh my God, I know why it's so successful. You know, I knew it's going to be good, but it is way, way better than I thought it was going to be. It's, it's amazing. It's really, really impressive. Um, I'd like to say thanks to Lydia for being here. Give it your evening as well. And for virtual event specialists, if you, don't uh, haven't seen this website, then please check it out. Um, I'm very, very proud to be part of this team. Um, it's an amazing team of specialists that are very, very happy to help in all areas. So certainly worth giving us a shout. And just a little tiny plug, this is me. This is what I'm going to be doing as of next month. So I will be just being into a black hole of um, probably just you know, going slowly mad. Um, but uh, you can currently, I will still be working with VDS as well, um, doing some advice calls on an ad hoc basis. But if I could ever help with anything, you've got some questions or some ideas how I can answer some of these questions, Please feel drop me an email. It's not through the VDS website, but through there. Um, and uh, thank you very much indeed. Move.